This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Attention all rodeo athletes. Join us for the Cowtown Christmas Championship Rodeo in December. Over $360,000 in prize money in the historic Cowtown Coliseum in Fort Worth, December 14th through 17th. And no entry fees. Qualify using the VRQ for the Triple Crown of Rodeo 1 million cash bonus. Featured on a CBS network broadcast. To get started, go to the App Store, download the WCRA Rodeo app, and hit nominate. This is your chance to rodeo in December. Nominate today or visit us at WCRARodeo.com. Guys, another year has ticked by. Challenging year, but there was somebody you could rely on if you needed a new Super Duty pickup, and that was Bill Fick Ford. Once again, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country. You guys have seen what's going on in the car business, in the truck business. You're seeing trucks being sold for thousands above MSRP. Well, if you go to Bill Fick Ford, it doesn't matter where you are at in the continental U.S. He will take care of you. He will stand by the product and he will not take advantage of you. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the only place you can go in 2022 for a no bull discount. Bill Fick Ford. What sets Resist All apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand. These traditions are passed down from fathers to sons, from heroes to future champions. Since 1927, Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it every day. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we're alone, but we're not really alone. We've got Mark D'Ambrosio, who did two stints on the TV show Alone. You guys know what that show is. Uh, he nearly won his first round, but uh, he almost died, and luckily he got out of there when he did, or he would have died, and we wouldn't have got to talk to him, but he has lived a pretty unique life. He served in the military, was a survival expert, went on the show Alone, kicked the shit out of that show. And uh, now he's here to talk to us. Check it out. What are we going to talk about on here? You know <laughs> so what I want to talk about? Astrology is what I feel. Yes. Just based on your Definitely appearance, astrology. I figured astrology. <laughs> and hippie stuff. Yeah, I, I figured that. that would be. That's why I live in thing. Portland. Yep. Um, yep. Makes sense. No, uh, you know, alone, absolutely. Anything hunting, long range shooting uh, involved. Because um, I started doing some pretty insane courses with. Mm-hmm. Uh, different dudes this year and then uh i started a wine business mm. it's all an adventure based wine business really so it's like you know there's qr code on the back and let me show you these things real quick yeah so you know what the heck i'm talking about because you would like it because it's all about if you like the outdoors yeah i don't know you by the way so I don't know. <laughs> I'm you're just like assuming I'm, yeah 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 and, yeah I'm, I'm, i'll check that out so they all have something on the outside, right? So you can start a fire with one of them. You can catch fish with one of them. You can. Uh, That's pretty bullets. slick, right? Yeah, that is slick. So I'm trying to promote the shit out of that. Yeah, you should. Yeah, but it's a it's a learning lesson. Yeah, any any entrepreneurship is a big lesson. <laughs> That's cool. For sure. Yeah, I just got back from Montana doing a epic master camping mastermind with ten high level entrepreneurs. Really. Yeah, like it a was, Kaizen event in the mountains kind of thing. Yeah, it was, yeah. and, uh, you know, we took them out there, and I was helping teach the sustainment stuff, I guess, to mm-hmm. give them some activities to do while they're out there. But uh, sure. really, since I own two businesses, I got to, you know, take part in it. I was not at their level by any means, but uh, it was super neat. But you know what they say. I mean, you, you should try to align yourself with people who are so far above you that you can get to that level. You're, yep. you're the sum of your five closest people. That's like the most common thing people say. So, uh, And the crazy thing is I've been, I've been working at this ranch in Colorado for four years, and they're all high level. Like they're either – most of them are like uh, eight figures and above, and sure. high eight figures. And it's like I didn't learn jacks. In four years, I learned less than I did in – you know, three days. 
Really? Doing that mastermind as far as business goes, because that's what it was all about. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, right event, you know, right place, mm-hmm. right time. They're not focused on their thing, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe you felt more comfortable to ask questions. That's always been a tough thing. That they I were struggled. forced questions, you know. It was like, really? a, it was that forced conversation to, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think the good thing that we should do is probably have you introduce yourself, explain who you are, some of your background, and we can work into some of these other really neat topics. Because, I mean, you have to be a very unique individual to want to partake in something like that. And so I think there's probably a backstory on how you got to be who you are that would put you in a position where you're like, this is a good idea. Doing hard shit. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. Mm-hmm. I like for some reason to do hard stuff. Yeah. Specific people really. I mean, and that's one thing that like people who take on entrepreneurship or challenges or high level military things, they all have kind of that screw that's tightened to adversity, craving adversity. Yeah. But yeah. Tell us uh, about yourself, like who you are and we'll kind of go from there. We've been rolling, by the way. Oh, you're rolling. We've been rolling this whole time. He's he's waiting for, like, click. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't Discovery Channel. All right, yeah. (laughs) It's the history. (laughs) Yeah, History Channel. Um, All right, so, uh, yeah, my name is Mark D'Ambrosio. I grew up hunting, fishing, surfing, so it was kind of a weird uh, mix right there. I couldn't decide whether I wanted a surfboard in my hand or a gun. (laughs) But uh, joined the military when I was 22, got into uh, recon, went scout sniper after being in a recon unit uh conducted operations with those guys for a while then i went to go instruct as a recon scout sniper up at the mountain warfare high angle uh sniper course and that was one of the best jobs i ever had ever had like getting paid for you know um the mountain survival course we ran that as well so that's when i kind of developed a passion for teaching fast forward to 2017 i got out um, separated from my hearing, so can't hear well out of my left ear or my right ear. But uh, and then I started my own business teaching, shooting, sustainment, uh, mostly military and law enforcement starting off. Then a transition to hunters, and now uh, I teach uh, mostly like individual private courses where I take people out deep in the back country. I take them from not being able to change a truck tire all the way to being able to navigate 30 miles to the mountains off trail with a little mini compass, engaging targets, <laughs> and starting friction fires. Um, so that's the end goal. Usually takes four to six courses. Mm. Um, I've been doing that since 2017. In the meantime, I've also uh, I was on a loan season seven. I was on a loan frozen, which was last year, just aired, and I was uh, and I started a wine brand this year. So all over the place with different things as far as, you know, I guess what I do. Yeah. Well, let's go way back because I, I'm always curious when I, when I get to talk to people who chose military as their initial career, or their starting path, you know, about some of their formative years and kind of what led you to want to do that specifically. Yeah. So, you know, I was a uh, man in high school. I think my senior year I only had one class that I had to do to finish the credits. And so I only had second period and I was working. That means I was working full time at Texas Roadhouse and I was just cooking and cleaning dishes and all the way up until I was, well, 19 is when it really hit me. I do not want to be working three jobs to sustain buying my fancy truck and my motorcycles and the lifestyle that I want. Mm -hmm. So I started training. Um, I looked at online. I was like, what's the most badass thing there is out there? And, I'm not saying recon is the most badass thing out there, but it's, you know, I think they're all pretty equivalent if I'm being honest. But, uh, I saw a guy coming up out of the water with a rifle with cami paint on his face and a ghillie suit and kind of ridiculous, but it was (laughs) awesome. I was like, that's what we're going to (laughs) do. So we trained for force recon for, uh, for two years, me and my buddy, he lost a hundred pounds. I gained 60. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when we went in, so was there was there a regimen like you went Googled or whatever was available at that time I just to, knew to the pull standards, a regimen? And- I just knew the standards I had to pass, standards I had to meet. Sure. And I was like, oh, this sucks. We got to train because if we go in there, like, we're going to get our asses handed to us. Yeah. So I would say most people probably don't train to that level for two years. Sure. Um, before going in. But because my buddy was, you know, fat, <laughs> uh, we had to lose some weight. So I was like, might as well just, I was skinny. Yeah. I was a stick. So... We went in. Uh, we were a little bit older, I guess, than some, and then uh, you know, physically fit, and mostly got. I mean, everybody that passed obviously was extremely physically fit. But you know, 
that's when I would say the first time that I really pushed my mind and body and soul um, to the point of almost breaking, but not breaking. But I pushed myself pretty damn far um, going through those courses and then deploying. You'd think that like the selection process and going through those courses is the hardest. Being in the damn unit is the hardest, you know. Uh, being through a pre-dive, which is uh, getting you ready for dive school, you drown a hell of a lot more in pre-dive than you do in dive school. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, um, I guess in my mind, I was like, hey, I don't want to work three jobs. And I was also thinking about the war that was happening at that point in time. And um, I was a senior in high school. Uh, I graduated 2004. And, uh, and so the war just kicked off, you know, not shortly before that. And uh, my whole thought process was, man, these guys that signed up for this, uh, they didn't even sign up for war. And I was a single dude, and I was like, well, let's go help them out. I guess in my head I was, you know, I wanted to help those dudes out if I could. But I didn't want to go to, like, just any unit. So I wanted to do something um, where I felt like people knew what they were doing a little bit more. So that's why I kind of chose that route. Yeah. I thought it looked cool. Yeah, I don't blame you. That does sound really cool when you explain it in detail. It's like, yeah, I get it. If you're going to choose one thing. I mean, like if you're if you're kind of a hardcore guy, there's only a few paths like you can go in the military, right? If you want to be absolutely hardcore. So, I don't know, man. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. The the cuz I've worked with every branch in the DOD and it's like at the end of the day it's pretty interesting cuz you could be in I look at it all the same now. Really? Yeah, like I know a lot of Marines are like, "Oh, Marine Corps." Uh, but Man, the Marines, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, they're all the same. They all serve their purpose. They're all sure. good people. And, um, you know, as far as hardcore, like, I've seen Marines cry before for having to kill a rabbit. Right. You know, so it's like, <laughs> you know, you you got all walks of life in every branch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. But, okay, that's a, that's an interesting backstory. But, I mean, how how long were you in? Uh, almost 10 years. Almost 10. So yeah. it was not just, hey, I'm going to do my four, get out, or, or do one extension. No, it was, I had just made up my mind that I was staying in for a career. Mm -hmm. um, after I got done instructing, I was like, all right, yeah, hey, I'm, and I was happy. Really? And about a year after I had re-enlisted, that, that would take me to 12 years, and I'd only have eight after that, but about a year after I re-enlisted, they were like, uh, you can't hear well enough to pass the physical for free fall. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so? <laughs> Usually when I walk around with comms on my head when we're on a mission, I would take my earpiece and i put it up halfway. Yeah. So I could, like, hear my team members, but I could also hear what was going on in my comms. And, uh, you know, it did not work out for me as far as staying in the Marine Corps. They're like, you can either go be a cook or something lesser than a recon <laughs> Marine. Yeah. Or you can get out. And I was like, I'm going to try and figure out life on the outside. Yeah. So what, what caused, uh, what caused the hearing issue? Was that something Guns, that was, man? Yeah, it was mostly, it was the Marine Corps and yeah. shooting, uh, really it was just a, a 50 cal out of a bird, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a, a sasser. So not a, um, it, so it was a, I'm, it's not a sniper rifle, but it's a semi-automatic scoped rifle. Hmm. I think is what it stands for. God, it's been so long. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just a, a big, heavy weapon system, and you need to really wear double hearing protection when you're shooting, but I needed to be able to talk to the pilot, sure. kind of tell him what to do, and it just didn't work out for me. So that happened in 2010, and I was lucky enough to go all the way to 2017 without them figuring out how bad it was. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. So yeah, that's why I lost the hearing, and you yeah. know what, like, Wear ear protection, guys. If you're ever out there shooting guns, I'll tell you, I wear more ear pro now than I ever did because I barely have any hearing left. Yeah, yeah, that's the mistake. I mean, I certainly made that mistake too, but yeah. luckily it wasn't a 50 cal. Yeah. But, you know, a 12-gauge shotgun in your ear also does damage. So. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting, and I guess it prompts a lot of questions, but I think we should talk about some more of kind of your story before I ask you all of these deep interesting questions because I always have a lot of questions for military personnel especially nowadays because there's so many interesting I'm using the word interesting very loosely things happening in the military right now but you know and I always wonder people who serve their country what they think about some of those things mm -hmm. um, whether or not you have an opinion or not but so once you left the military 
you started teaching and, and, you know, there's another path before you decided to try and do this TV show, obviously, but mm-hmm. what got you from, Hey, military, this was my path. This is who I am to your next stage to thinking, you know what? The show looks pretty dope. I always thought the show was dope. I was actually in the military uh, when it first kicked off instructing the mountain survival course. And we saw this as an instructor. We were like, this is amazing. Um, it was just the most realistic survival show that there was out there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I ended up getting out and started my own business teaching what I knew, which was um, what I was good at, which is the sustainment and the shooting aspect and the you know, survival, if you want to call it survival. Um, and it, you know, I went through, uh, Donnie dust, one of Donnie dust course, cause I'm a big advocate of going through follow on training, even as a instructor, mm-hmm. you never know it all. So um, explain what that is, that Donnie follow dust. on training. Well, or Donnie specific. dust. Yes. So yeah, Donnie dust. He was on season six of alone. Um, this dude is just a primitive survival expert and where I'm more of a, a modern use equipment. I mean, I'm pretty good with a friction fire and bow drill and hand drill, but like that dude, when it comes to napping or making arrowheads or doing everything as primitive as it gets, I would say he's one of the leading experts in that. So me and my buddy, Jerry, uh, who was an instructor with me in the Marine Corps at that course, we kind of stood up that survival course. We both were running the business together and we were like, Hey, we're going through his course. So we went through three days with Donnie dust. And because we had done that, we got to know him. Turns out he was one of Jerry's infantry instructors in the Marine Corps, which is kind of crazy. And then, uh, yeah, he recommended me for season seven. So that's kind of how I got on there because I never applied. Um, They kind of reached out to me, and then I just sent in my content and videos to try and compete for a spot. Sure. So is that that usually what people are doing? They're like, wow, I want to try that, and they apply? Normally, yeah, they'll get like thirty to sixty to a hundred thousand applicants. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah, people wanting to get on the show and do it and test it, and it's, I mean, in my opinion, it's the like the Olympics for survival. Yeah, you know, because you're out there by yourself and you only have ten items, and you're dropped off the worst time of year. You got to film everything, and uh, yeah, you got to try and make it happen. Yeah. So what was the, cause I'm just really interested in like what the interview process would be like, like how long of a process was that? What type of questions did they ask you? You know, so with that many people applying, I mean, that just sounds like a massive task to find the right people to do it. And you know, and, and, and for people that have seen the show in the past, all the way up to the current seasons, they're getting so much better with choosing the right people. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I mean, so they'll, they'll take you, um, they kind of sift through and they're like, hey, here's our top 40 people. After they have their top 40, you send in all your content. And they're like looking at people's social media. Um, it's pretty easy nowadays to kind of pick good people because you can see their skills on social and see if it's fake or if they're funking their skills or faking their skills. But uh, so after that, you send in all your content, they'll make reels out of it, and then they'll pick the top 20. Mm-hmm. After they pick the top 20, um, in the past, before COVID, you showed up usually in New York or somewhere, and then you competed. You, don't, you weren't competing against them. You're just showing them what you could do. Sure. Um, how you'd build a shelter, how you'd start a fire, if you can swim, um, the basic stuff. Um, and so, and that's, but they're also getting to see your personality. So if you're try, sitting there trying to be someone that you're not, you're not going to be able to sustain that for long term, especially when you're tired, you're cranky, or, you know, you're not eating or you're starving. Right. Or you're shitting your sleeping bag. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was like, you know, we, we did that, and then they, they choose and they select, a, hey, congratulations, you made it for season seven. You got like a month to get ready. Oh, you only get a month, huh? Well, it's yeah, it's not much. Like a month, month and a half um, in between them actually selecting you to when you're going. Wow. Um, sometimes a little bit longer, but sometimes they're delayed in the process. Sure. And... So you're like, all right. And then you show up on site and you get to meet all the other contestants that, you know, you already should have met in New York, but because of COVID, it might've been like a teleconference or something, Mm -hmm. but there's a psychological exam. You know, there's a medical exam, there's paperwork out the ass. You got to sign. Uh, I mean, it got to the point where I'm just like, I don't even know what I'm signing. I don't care. (laughs) Clearly I want to do this. So yeah, it's kind of like buying something. Like you're not going to read it. You're just going to sign it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was a, 
then you go and you do it and see if you can actually do it. Right. So, so you, they give you about a month because there's still some more questions I have. Did they like suggest things that you should do to get prepared for it? Mm. Or did you have a pretty good idea from watching the show? I just, and then, there, I mean, I wonder if you watch it, I'm sure there's so much you see, but then when you get there, there's so many things that you didn't expect, I'm sure. Oh, there's a, exactly like, uh, and every season's different usually. So usually every season's in a different area. We were super lucky because it was in the same general vicinity as season six. So we'd got to see a previous season go there and what they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, uh, as far as setting you up for success, I mean, they've got a, they've got two survival consultants out there that in my opinion, um, Dave, one of them, uh, he's got to be the smartest man when it comes to survival and how the human body deals with human starvation, because in today's world, he's like seeing it in every single contestant, but he's gone to every single, uh, season. So he's been to every single location, worked with the indigenous people of that location, wrote the book for, you know, Hey, this is the plants that are common in this area. So, but you get to go there, you get to prep a little bit and you get to see the general area you're in, you're not taken to your spot or anywhere sure. near it, but you know, you get to see the general area you're in to kind of, Hey, start getting ready. Um, but you already have a, a deep understanding of survival and sustainment and feeding yourself and maybe not a deep understanding of being by yourself, mm -hmm. but a deep understanding of how to do these basic skills to be able to make it to the next day. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, as far as prepping, uh, one of the things that I did big time is I made gill nets a lot. Um, I made a lot of gill nets, and I made over and over and made sure my cordage was the exact measurement. And then I would get my bow, and I would shoot my uh, tr trad bow a lot, trying to get better with that because... Hey, was, explain what a trad bow is. Yeah, so a traditional bow. Um, it could be a, a, a recurve, or it could be a long bow. Um, you know, I kind of went from compound growing up to... Uh, and I shot some recurve growing up, but I went from compound to a reflex deflex, which is kind of in between a recurve and a long bow. Mm-hmm. And then I went to a bow that I, a stick that I built with my own two hands. And that's what I'm elk hunting with this year. Really? Um, and so, you know, traditional archery, there's a big difference between having a shelf where the arrow sits on it and not having a shelf. Yeah. Meaning it's sitting on your hand. Yeah. And that's as, you know, traditional as it gets when it comes to the bow world. Um, but you're shooting with a, a stick essentially now, mm -hmm. but it could be a fiberglass traditional bow. Sure. Yeah. So I would practice that. I would, uh, and the snaring portion, I was really confident in snaring, um, but I'd never made a gill net before, you know, and that's something that produced like 350 pounds of fish for me. Right. Something that I've never even made, like never even Im implemented in real life because it's illegal. Sure. Um, and so when I went out there and I started catching fish day one, I was like, this is awesome, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it was just, uh, and then it was, you know, you figure out if you are going to be happy if you're out there. Like, I didn't know if I was going to last five days or 10 days or 20. Yeah. Um, I went out there and I was like, oh, I'm having a good time. Yeah. yeah. It's fun. It sucks. It's a lot of work, but I was having a good time. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So, so you get dropped off. I mean, what you have 10 items and mm -hmm. I, I mean, I haven't watched the show in a long time and, and I purposely, when I found out you were coming on, didn't want to, so that I could like have the wonder of asking all <laughs> these questions, but, uh, cause it's almost like you discover something again if, if you don't consume it for a while, cause it is a wildly entertaining show, but so they drop you and they give you these 10 items, especially for the people who don't know. I think everybody knows what the show is, but maybe some people haven't listened to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what are these 10 items that, that you get? Do you well, get so to choose from some items or exactly. are you assigned 10? No, they don't assign them. So they've got different categories and you're allowed to bring, um, there's rules and regulations what you can bring, but you bring all your own gear. So sleeping bag, for example, I wanted, we were going to the Arctic, so I went and ordered a $2,000 sleeping bag. I think my gear allotment was, did not cover all my gear. I'll just say that. So uh, if it doesn't, does that mean you can spend your own money to get, oh yeah, to you, cover can, the, you can, okay, so you can do what you, you can want. You can spend as much, yep, as much money as you want, but um, in the past, and it, historically speaking alone, it, the contestants that are going on there aren't exactly they don't that have well much off money. financially, yeah. um, and that's, you know one of the reasons why they're so successful in the show is because they're hard people. They've been mm -hmm. living hard lives. But 
you know, so I, I, I spent two grand on a sleeping bag from PhD and it's a negative 72 degree bag, mm-hmm. which is insane. Right. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of like, okay, well, if I have a bivy, it's a, this sleeping bag's a bivy on the outside, waterproof on the outside and down on the inside. Mm-hmm. That's still only one sleeping bag. Right. So there's ways to like, you know, figure out how to, for gear selection, I was like, okay, well, I need to produce food. I don't want to bring any food because I want to see if I can get it. Sure. And that was the whole purpose. Is that me. something people would do is they bring like dried, dried yep. foods and things yep. like that? They can bring like a pound of this or a pound of that or two pounds of this. And, um, it's, you know, so you have all these options of the stuff you can bring and really who knows who's making the right decision. Right. Um, cause you don't know what location you're going to, you don't know your resources. So all I knew is I wanted to provide food. So I brought five fifty cords so I can make a gill net and I could tie stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to make string. Sure. Um, I brought an ax. I brought a saw. I brought a, I did not bring a fixed blade knife. Instead, I brought a Leatherman cause mm-hmm. it has a knife on there. Sure. So now I had my Leatherman and my ax that both had blades on them. I brought some snare wire, uh, cause I wanted to catch food. I brought uh, a bow with nine arrows, kind of as one item, a pot to boil water in, uh, a, f- a ferro rod. Cause I'm not trying to do a bow drill fire every day. So mm-hmm. for friction fires, a sleeping bag and a fishing kit. So I brought four different ways to procure food. If I counted right. Um, four different ways to procure food instead of bringing a single food item. And I'll tell you, man, I've snared rabbits. I snared game. I, I caught fish in the water. I mean, I shot squirrels and rabbits with my bow. Um, so almost every single one of those methods provided food. Sure. Um, so that's, I think, one of the most rewarding things to be able to be dropped off in absolute isolation. I've never done that before. Like, we're talking, like, where we were, zero human I didn't see any trash. I found like one can from a long time ago. <laughs> and I, you kind of like expecting to find trash. That's right. like a survivor man's survival. You man's look dream. for it probably. Yeah. And I didn't have jack squat. And I was like, wow, we were out here. And even the animals acted different. I've never seen a rabbit run across, look at me. And it's like, what is that thing? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Phew, <clears throat> this could be a little bit easier than what I was expecting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, but once they, you get in their area, they learn you, then that's a different story. Um, yeah. So what were the tactics that you used to try to prevent that? Right. Cause I guess I could see like, if you hunt too close to your camp or you don't go far enough out in certain areas to find game that, that they could learn your patterns, like you're trying to learn theirs maybe. Um, yeah, maybe, uh, for the trapping, you know, the only thing I implemented with trapping, well, you're just getting as much as you can, as fast as you can. Sure. So if it's around your camp, then you take it, get it, um, try and freeze it. But you know, there is some. Uh, there is a process to this sometimes because if you kill a large game animal before, say, day 30 on our show, our season, you're not going to be able to preserve that. Like, you're not going to be able to preserve it all. Sure. If, you you know, if uh, if Roland would have killed that muskox, like, four days before he did, he killed it perfect timing. But if he would have killed a muskox four days before he did, uh, he would have been having to sit there and trying to dry it out. Well, then it would have froze, so he would have been kind of lucky. But, say, day 10, a lot of that would have spoiled um i was catching you know two to four huge trout a day and it was a constant fire going to smoke all those fish yeah constantly and it was exhausting but so when it comes to came to taking animals i knew i was like okay i have to have a process i'm doing every day and that could be i'm going to go check my gill net in the morning and on the way to my gill net i'm going to check my rabbit snares on the way back i'm going to do this hunting loop where i'm going to be hunting on the way back come back work on the shelter do an hour of firewood, uh, and then it's kind of go back to check the gill nets, traps, um, and a little bit more hunting. But it's really build your shelter. Once you get that up, it's food, 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 um, and then just trying to stay busy, honestly, I think, to keep that mental state up there. And Yeah, it's kind of like a, it's kind of a fascinating thing because if you look at and just hearing you and your process, it's like I'm thinking like, wow, it really simplifies life. Yeah. It really simplifies life because we have so much noise and, you know, we all go through so many different things that seem so chaotic. I mean, goodness, it's, it's just that season for everybody where whatever can go wrong seems to go wrong, but it's, it's all such monetary type things. And, and a lot of it, it just really doesn't matter if someone were to drop you in the wilderness, you just said it, it's food, food, food. And that is like the b- largest currency in our entire existence. It's yeah. kind of unbelievable if you think how yeah. simple life gets, if that's your only goal, really. 
Well, one and, of. and it boils down to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you're taken down to the very bottom of the pyramid. And you know, people. The question I get a lot is like, "Did you want to have sex while you're out there?" <laughs> Like, Let me answer that right now. Negative. <laughs> yeah. No. There is zero desire for anything to work in that regards. Like, you do not care. And it actually took a while from when I got back to even care about sex. But, like, yeah. you don't. Your body is deprived of nutrients. It's not even on your mind. Um, and so, you know, when you're taken to that bottom level, you can't move up in that pyramid until you start securing these basic needs, which is fire, water, shelter, food. Um, once you have those, that's when your mind can start being like, oh, I miss family or, oh, I miss my kid. What's life, what is it really worth? Um, is this worth it to me and stuff like that? But Guys, rock and roll denim has absolutely changed the game when it comes to the performance and style in Western jeans. Top competitors like Shad, Tim O'Connell, Shelly Morgan, you name it. Your boy right here. We're all wearing rock and roll denim inside and outside of the arena. It gives you the flexibility you need to win as well as looking absolutely great in your interviews, appearances, whatever it is you're doing. Even if you're just doing podcasts like me. I had a chance to go to Rock and Roll Denim's factory the other day and pick out all the pants I wanted. Here's the thing. I got to try on a bunch of their new jeans. I love the men's revolver jeans with the reflex stretch technology because they're comfy. They're not stiff like some of the other jeans. Go check them out at rockandrolldenim.com or follow Rock and Roll Denim on Facebook and Instagram for the newest trends in Western fashion. Rockandrolldenim.com. It when you were talking, you just mentioned like uh, there's no noise. When you come back after spending, let's just say 44 days, 44 days in the wilderness by yourself and all you're having is a med team check up on you for one hour every like two weeks it's your only human interaction and what are they doing taking vitals yeah, making sure making sure you're not going to no, die no, while you're out no there infections or things like that yep so you do that and you come back and there's a generator going off and you're like you hear everything you feel everything you smell everything and you're like wow uh, our senses are so dumbed down because we spend all day looking at our phone. Your vision's better. Not mine, because I had trichinosis and everything was failing on my body. But, like, most people's <laughs> Not vision's mine, like, but anybody else's. Yeah, <laughs> like, their vision's better, right? And, yeah. and, like, you can smell more, you can hear more, and you realize that that lifestyle is just better. Now, obviously, I'm not out there. I live in a house. I live in a neighborhood. Um, I don't live in the middle of the wilderness. I didn't just, you know, go completely off-grid, but, like, I appreciate a toilet. I appreciate a chair. You appreciate everything way more. The things that we may not appreciate running water. Um, so it's, and all I was eating was fish, squirrels, rabbits, um, berries, some berries that I'd find. And then it was, and reindeer moss, which is disgusting. And then, uh, all I was drinking was water. So it's like one of the cleanest diet. Well, it's the cleanest diet I've ever been on. Sure. Um, cleanest way of living. I was brushing my teeth with charcoal um, and my teeth had never felt better. Yeah. And it's crazy to think like that's natural. Yeah. That's something that anybody can get. Um, just burn a log, get some charcoal and start brushing your teeth. But, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of things I found out about myself from doing that show that were pretty amazing. So I went and did the show again and it was called Alone Frozen and it's airing now. So they already aired the first two episodes i want to say mm -hmm. i'm only going to talk about my episode i only stayed until day five but like you know alone frozen after i went and did it the first time and you go back and do it a second time it's like all right i already know i can catch food i already know i can be out here for 44 days um, so now it's like what am i going to do how am i going to do this what's my strategy and is it worth it and i went out there the second time and i was like pumped to be out there Things were extremely different. I'll just say that uh, this go around for the way the show was laid out. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to stay for that. So I decided to leave after uh, day five. But like talk about another amazing experience going to see another part of the world. Mm -hmm. And you go out there and you're like, all right. And I looked at my area and I said, I can't provide food for myself to actually be to thrive or even to live. So there, I would call it three different stages in alone. Uh, I'd say you're either surviving, you're living, or you're thriving. Um, 
you want to be living. You know, it might suck, but you're living. Um, the, well, the goal, I guess, would be to be thriving, right? You're happy. You've got your uh, moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're going to start building a city. You're going to find a woman out there. You're right. going to, you know, start a tribe. It's not going to ever happen. But, yeah, so like, um, that's the goal. But when you're just surviving, you're really like, what am I doing? Just starving out here? Mm-hmm. I'm just seeing if I can sit out here and see how long I can go until they, they pull me for starvation. But it's only because there's another, there's a way out probably, right? What do you mean? Well, like you're thinking those thoughts, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's like you're thinking because there is this contingency, like I could just wave my hand and be done. Uh-huh. But if you were truly like in a survival situation where it was literally the only option, you you're, know, oh, you're out there. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're out there. And yeah. I just wonder if the thought process would be different. So, oh, it absolutely is because this is a game. Yeah. You know, this is, it's a hundred percent a game and it's, it's a realistic game. But the thing is like, what's its purpose? So for, for me, it was never about the money, whether it was the million or the 500, I, you tax it. It can be, I can spend money pretty quick. So it could be gone pretty quick. Right. Right. Um, and so for me, it was, Hey, I teach this stuff for a living. I really want to put my skills to the test and I want to be able to, uh, see what really works out of the books. Cause I've never spent that kind of a time by myself in the wilderness with just these items. So, um, it, that was super rewarding going out there and doing that and figuring out what worked. But f- the money aspect, if you're going there for the money, then yeah, starve it out, you know, go there. And if that's what your time's worth for me, time is money. And if I was to spend, I looked at it and I was like, okay, I got 45 days left. And I was like 45 days, or I could go home to my kid hang out with him and spend 45 days towards growing my business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, starve it out or do something worthwhile. And I was looking at it. I was like, it's just a money thing at this point. And I was like, no, I'm not, that's not what I'm about. Yeah. Um, I looked at my area and I, and I, uh, the area that I was given and I gave it five days ago, there's not jack shit here for food. Right. And I was looking at it. I was like, ah, that sucks. And I had, you know, that's the cards you get dealt sometimes. And so people are like, well, that's what you got to do. You got to deal with that adversity and go out there. And for me, it's like, well, I know that I can, and it was only a 50 day challenge. Right. Right. So, um, I was like, well, everybody here had either gone 50 days or pretty damn close. Sure. Yeah. Including you. Yeah. 44 days with trichinosis. I feel like it almost counts as 50, but it doesn't, I'm not going to take it away. (laughs) But like with heart failure, I feel like it's, you know, pretty close. Yeah. I think you get you get like a, like a at least a, you get at least a couple attack. hours, you know? yeah, something. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> but yeah. So you know, the whole purpose of doing alone and for everybody that ever wants to go out there is to it should be to reconnect to that natural side of life, to go out there and to push your mind, body, and soul to levels you've never pushed it before. And I pushed mine the first season until heart failure, and so I was like. I felt pretty good about pushing it that far. I didn't know I was in heart failure, but I pushed it to that level. And I was like, okay, I've done some hard shit in life. I was a recon Marine. I was a scout sniper. Um, I started a business. That's just not easy. But physically speaking, uh, hunting, being a recon Marine, being a sniper, those were physically exhausting things. And when I, when I was out there and I'm eating and I'm ha- struggling more than I was in any of those combined, I was like, it's time to go. I'm done. I hit my breaking point. And thank God I quit when I quit or else I would have, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. So within a couple of days. Yeah. That's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Like that's almost like a, like a divine intervention. Yeah. You know, the whole idea of that, because you didn't know what, what, what had you feeling that way. I just knew I was tired. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm being a little bitch. All right. Is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> is what it is. And I was freaking, I'm tired. And they were like, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm fucking tired. Yeah. They're like, that's it? You're tired? I'm like, you don't understand. I'm just, I carry like these little sticks. I'm exhausted. Yeah. It's like, it's hard to breathe. I'm so tired. Yeah. And so, you know, when I, when we, it took like five or six days until we found out I was in congestive heart failure. Yeah. But, uh, it, it is an intervention and it, but it's such a, I don't know, man. It, I, I suggest anybody that's listening to this, if they can, Go to the wilderness, go to the woods, go to the mountains, go to the beach, wherever you're at, and just spend five days by yourself, four days by yourself, three days by yourself with nothing, no phone, no email. Bring food, enjoy it, 
You know what I mean? You don't have to go out there and try and find your own food, but just spend that amount of time with no other human interaction. That is medicine that is good for the soul. You actually find out if you like yourself too while you're out there, right? Yeah. I'm, so I'm wondering about some of the self-reflection stuff that maybe you went through and if that was difficult, if you liked what you saw, if you if it created an opportunity for you to change the things you didn't, what type of growth came? Yeah, I was worried. Yeah. And I had some demons in my closet and I'm like, oh God, they say if you don't like yourself, like you you might not last that long out there. It'll show for sure. And so I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I like myself. And that was a question I was asking myself when I went out there. Like, I mean, I think I do, but I don't know. And I got out there and I was like, I was having a blast. And I was like, I love who I am. I love what I'm doing. I love, you know, me, I guess. Um, and what I've accomplished and who's in my life. And you become so grateful for the people that are in your life. Um you know, I've always been good with telling people to fuck off if they're not a good influ- you know, influence on my life. So I don't have, like, people that are bad in my life. Sure. Um, but as far as growth, like, I don't think I've, I mean, that was a significant growth period in my life. Uh, I'm very militarized, you know, very, have a military background, and um, I talk a lot. And I'm very loud. And hanging out with people like Callie and Kai and Amos and all these other contestants, Corey, like that are just soft-spoken individuals that are badasses mm-hmm. that eat plants for a living. You know, like, I'm not going to do modern medicine. I'm going to eat this plant. And I'm like, ah. And then I, you know, started opening my eyes more because, you know, there's some plant medicine I, I agreed with. But then I, over the last, since, since alone and meeting those guys and those, those women, like, unreal how... It's transforming into being just more natural with what I do. Um, even, you know, my mindset, my, uh, I'm trying to talk less and listen more. Right. Uh, but it goes directly into my, into my businesses too. So, you know, that experience, hanging out with those people, um, getting out of my comfort zone of the whole military aspect. Uh, it was just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. I imagine it, uh, probably shapes the way you live your life going forward and yeah so i mean it's a good it's a good recommendation like if somebody wants to know themselves go spend five days alone in the wilderness somewhere and it's crazy because everybody's like i could do that i'm like then do it you know it's it's not i'm not saying go out there and starve go bring a tent go to the mountains and go do it and it's like uh some people think that it's a waste of time you Mm -hmm. know I left on day five the second time because going more than that is a waste of time for me. It, sure. w- it wasn't worth my time. Um, and it was just because of the setup and, and there was not going to be the same payoff at the end or, you know, I had, I had left my son when he was, he just turned one and then I went and did the show. And so I missed out on that period of, in his life and sure. I'm not with my son's mother. So I only get to see him like not that often every other weekend. Sure. Um, and because of his age and like, so I went to go do it again. And his mom was like, really? You're going to leave your kid again? And I, I was see. like, mm. well, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that's happening twice. <laughs> <laughs> so you rationalized like, it. The and I was like, time. you know what? I've done deployments. It's only 50 days. She'll get over it. Max will be okay. And I got out there and I was like, if I was to have food and I could be happy and I was going to be able to live right and not be miserable and degrade my life but at least uh hold the line then i would absolutely i would have stayed out there but, but if i'm going to go out there and just be miserable and lose a bunch of weight and people watching it the only thing they would think is this guy can't catch food right when in reality i looked at my area and i go there's nothing here right um, I heard one squirrel bark in five freaking days. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. one squirrel. Right. That's unreal. Uh, there's no, there was one pile of bear scat from like the early spring and that was it. I mean, so I it walked. was just bear in there. It, it was just, uh, yeah, whether or not, you know, production did it on purpose or didn't do it on purpose. I don't think they did. I think it's just sometimes you get a bad spot. Sometimes you're in a bad area. Um, and, and the reality was I told production, I was like, I would just leave, I would walk 
to the boundary where I can't walk anymore and start walking. I would move to an area that had stuff. I'd move inland. I would move down the coast. Um, but we weren't allowed to do that. And I was like, I would never stay here in a million years. I'm not going to stay here now. I'm not going to change who that, who I, who that, you know, that part of me. So with a smile on my face, I was like, I'm done. And it was crazy because it was only five days and I was kind of pissed because I was like really looking forward to do having that experience again of being able to be out there and, uh, building stuff. I love to build stuff, uh, per, but providing your own food. I mean, I didn't even catch a fish until day six. Um, the first time I did it. And so it's like, you know, I didn't get to that point where I was even providing food for myself. Um, but I just knew that it wasn't worth it. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Alone is by far one of my, uh, the most legit realistic shows there is out there. Uh, but, you know, it's a show. So when you have to put boundaries on something, um, it starts becoming like, okay, like what are the rules? There's sure. a lot of rules and regulations people don't know. Um, I'll just say that. I'm not going to ruin it. Um, yeah, but like, there's a lot of rules. There's your indigenous rules of whatever uh, tribe your land you're on, or indigenous people's land you're on. There's that country's rules. Mm -hmm. Then there's production's rules, because you know. Yeah, that I mean that creates some good questions, and maybe you can answer, maybe you can't. But like, so is is all the land that you guys are on indigenous people's land, so that you can kind of get away with certain things, or no, not always. Um, sometimes it is. Um, they're finding spots all around the world trying to to mix it up a little bit sure. and to really test people. So they, they're going uh, in an area that they weren't really, they're not watching the same area over and over and learning it. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because like harvesting game and things, I mean, like, obviously there's some clause and contingency there to allow you to harvest whatever game's around that's well, outside of the boundaries of a typical hunting season or what have you, right? Not all the time. Really? Yeah, like, uh, you know, where we were at, we had, you know, we were able to hunt black bear. Mm -hmm. We were able to hunt moose, but we had a cow tag and a bull tag. Um, really? So that's, or and they could, don't ever mention any Not a cow really or a bull. We could, we could kill either a cow or a bull. But not both. Not both. Um, but you can kill one of each. You could, but you could only kill 10 rabbits. And you could only kill 10 squirrels. And people are like, what? What the heck are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's limits on that ridiculous really? stuff. You were not allowed to kill a wolverine with a bow. Or you weren't allowed to trap it, but you could shoot it with a bow. Really? Um, your fishing hooks, no barbs. I don't know if you've ever been fishing without a barb in your hook, but it sucks when you're using a hand line. It's rough. If everybody else has done it, use a pole. It's not what I'm talking about. Use a hand line with your hand. Try and reel in a fish, a trout, without a barb. It sucks. Um, the... What was one of the other big ones? Oh, wolf tags. We were given wolf tags. And somebody was like, can't kill a wolf. Yeah. Nobody can kill a wolf. And they were like, dude, it's food. <laughs> like, right. We're trying to feed ourselves. So, you know, it's, it's, it is pretty insane. Like, and every season's different. So it's not like that's the same everywhere you go. Sometimes right. you can, you can't hunt bear. Sometimes you can. Sometimes it, it all depends. Sure. Yeah. Rules, regulations, but you know what? Like being able to go out there and just do it. Who cares about the rules? Like it's you, you abide by them, obviously, because everything is recorded, right? Yeah. You know? Well, so. yeah. And so, what are some of the regulations? Like as far because you're recording yourself, what eighty percent, ninety percent of the time, a hundred percent of the time you're yeah. recording yourself. But there's trail cams that are out there to make sure that you're following these rules. Not necessarily to make sure you're following the rules, just to catch. Um the scenes that you may not catch. Sure. Um, and so, you know, trying to go out there and do something that you're not supposed to do. I mean, it's just, no one likes a cheater. Right. Um, but like they would definitely be able to find out if they wanted to. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, you're tracked. Uh, yeah, they've got drones that'll fly over, you know, try and catch a, a shot of something, but like, yeah. And you never know when they're showing up. Right, so you could be doing something you're not supposed to be doing, shysty, and then they show up. But, like, you know, at the end of the day, there's nine other people usually that are out there, and they're dealing with the same thing. So figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what do you think the biggest lesson you took from the whole experience was? So my whole purpose of going out there the first time was to uh, 
not quit, right? And my whole thing was like, hey, do not quit. No matter what, you just don't quit, and you'll be all right. Like, you could die out there. It's better than quitting. And that's something that's been ingrained in my head through the recon and the scout sniper communities. And uh, the lesson I learned was, dude, know your body, push yourself. Absolutely push yourself physically, physically, mentally, and spiritually. But, like, if you listen to your sixth sense, that can keep you alive. Because just pushing your body to extreme failure, you're going to die. Right. And it's real easy uh, to do that in a situation like that. Um, you know, I got I got nothing but positive feedback from people because, hey, I'm here to be able to spend time with my son. Right. Well, the difference between two days is what the doctor told me. If I would have stayed out there for two more days, more than likely my heart would have completely failed. And that's, I mean, my legs had swollen up from my knees down. My troponin levels were through the roof. Right. Like it was it was go time. Oh, it was heart failure, but I didn't know any of that, right? Right. So, you know, I learned that, hey, it's okay to call it. If you're pushing yourself to a point where you're like, this is not making my life better. It, there's no way, shape, or form that my life's going to get better from this, then why are you there? Change your life. Do something different. Right. Hit the tap button <clears throat> if you have to and start over. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with uh, starting over. Now, if it's a habit of yours where you're always quitting everything and you're always starting over, then that might be something that needs to be looked at. But as far as, like, people staying in the same rut in life and not actually getting out of that rut, like, sometimes you just got to hit the reset button, go yeah. back to the drawing board, whether that's a job, right, or whether that's um, a way of living. It's just, yeah, I mean... I do pay close attention to my lifestyle and I just went and did a, like an entrepreneurial trip up in Montana and they have these 10 ways to rate yourself for business, for business. And, uh, they have these 10 ways to rate ways to rate yourself. And it was like, Hey, um, how happy are you with your job or does it serve purpose? Um, and I'm rating myself at the highest you could go fives at these. And then it was like, financially, how are you? And I'm like, ah, I could probably use some work financially. Or, right. Um, how much downtime do you get from your cell phone? And I'm like, I need to get more downtime. I'm horrible with just checking social media or posting stuff on there. And, you know, it's addicting. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was an eye opening trip for me too. doing this last one where it's like, Hey, trying to just live a better, healthier life. Um, at the same time, building business, building a business and building a, a lifestyle for my my kid because he's my 100 percent my purpose now um so yeah. yeah that's a hard lesson right when you get stuck in ruts and and a lot of what you're saying speaking to me personally but um one of the hardest things i think that happens to us in life when we have children is having this like especially if you're one of those like i'm gonna do this me me i'm doing i'm doing i'm doing is finding a way to remove yourself from that position or that spotlight and actually focus on somebody else's needs above your own i mean that is one of the hardest things, you know, it's a female trait to do that, but it's not a male trait. Yeah, it's really difficult to that, do. Yeah. And, and that is an awesome way to think about that is to put somebody else's needs ahead of your own or to think about them because yeah, we are selfish as people, as humans. And like when you start thinking about, it, especially your kids, like life's not bad. You got a healthy kid, you know, then you're doing pretty good unless you hate your kid. But for me, I don't. Like, I love my kid, right? Well, what's but, that Jordan? I mean, how old is he? Is he still one, two years old now? No, nope, he's four. He's so four now. He yeah. four in September. Yeah, well, I don't know if you ever heard this line. I think everybody has it where Jordan Peterson goes. He's like, don't ever let your kids do things that make you hate them. Don't ever let them do things that make you dislike them. You know, so I think a lot of that's on us, right? Because when I think about kids, because I have kids, and my first kid was unexpected, and it thrust me into, like, being an adult, but... uh yeah, I always think about the fact that they didn't choose us as parents. They didn't choose the existence that they were walking into. And once they get to a certain age, sure, it's up to them. But, I mean, up until that whole point, like, we are responsible for crafting them into the people they're going to be. And, and if they see selfishness from a parent, then what does that do? That, like, creates a generational curse. Yeah. And we look at society today, and we've got a huge problem with um, raising kids. Um, we've got a huge problem because this country has never been more divided 
right? And it's, maybe it's just gone away or gotten a little bit better because it seems to mask itself sometimes. But like when I raise my son, I'm not raising him left or right. I don't care about any of that. I'm raising him to be a good human being. Um, and I'm raising him to seek adventure in life and to seek the mountains. And like, it's not a religion, right? I'm not going, Hey, this religion, I'm going, the mountains are your church for my kid. And if you want to get into religion, hell yeah, let's do it. You know, I'll learn some of something about it, but it's about, you know, like you're saying, guiding them and, uh, transforming them into the future because they are the future. And when we look at even hunting and conservation, oh man, I forget who said it, but, uh, you know, a, a, a true hunter is somebody that's thinking about their kids' future. So they're hunting, and that's conservation, is right. You're you're not out there hunting everything. You're out there hunting strategically. Um, so everything I do in this life, I'm like, okay, well, I need to be able to set my son up. I don't want to give him everything, but at the same time, I want to show him um, how to build a business that you can build a business that um, after being in the military, that you can do many hard things um, that. Oh, through hardship, through pain, misery, and suffering, you grow. Um, and that's something that I, I love teaching my kid. I love teaching my clients. Um, and I honestly believe one of the only reasons why I've made it to where I'm at in life is because I like doing hard shit. Uh, and I enjoy the suck is what you call it. So, you know, when, when you're miserable and you're out there and you're doing something that you put yourself through that most people wouldn't, and you put a smile on your face, uh, that's, that's as good as it gets. And that's really learning. But, you know, for me moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it was crazy because I went and did a vacation with my son recently, six days where we went from Washington down to crater Lake, down to my buddy Joe's cabin. Then we went shooting long range. It's only like, you know, almost four, but we shot. Then we went up to Lake Tahoe, did like a kayaking clear bottom tour and then we went to last national park and then back home mm -hmm. an amazing adventure for a four-year-old and that was the best vacation i've ever had in my life with a four-year-old <laughs> and i'm like wow that was insane and right then i knew that's the life like that's what i love that's self-actualization for me is like i am on my path of where i need to be um doing adventures with my kids showing him the things that i was lucky enough to be able to do you know go places see things be worldly, um, have your beliefs and your values, but also to be able to take a step back and go, well, let me look at, let me look at their values and their beliefs. Oh, that's cool. You know, I don't need to put it down or I don't need to, um, try and burn it to the ground. Do your own thing. I'm going to do my own thing, but you know, for him to be open-minded. So yeah, raising kids. I mean, for me, I knew I always wanted a kid. Um, and I didn't realize after I had one, like I didn't realize it would be it would consume me like it did. Yeah. So, you know, like you're saying, if you're ever having hard times, like, and you're sitting there working a job you don't want to do, like, well, hold on a second before you just quit that for selfish reasons. Like, think about your kid. Like, is it, would it benefit your kids and your family more to quit that job? Right? Because maybe you're stressed out to the max and all they need is a dad. Maybe you're making weight, you know, you're making great money, but they just need you to be present. You're never there. Um, or maybe it's the complete opposite where you're not making anything for money and you're stressed out. And you're like, well, oh, I might need to, you know, say goodbye to this and start working towards something else. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, life is such an individual journey, right? That Like there's so many little pieces that could apply or not apply. But I think at the end of the day, when I'm understanding what you're saying and kind of thinking about it, internalizing it, cause you're a pretty wise guy and, uh, and there's lessons and things that you're saying from your experiences, but you, you really just need to take a good look inward. And I think if you do that, usually you might find the answers. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, spending five days in the woods is a good time to take that look inward. I think you're right. And there's a whole nother thing. Like you have to set an example, right? Like if your kids, especially if you're a guy and you have sons um, and your sons see you never giving up, pursuing your dreams, pursuing your goals, you know, relentlessly pursuing like a purpose, right? That goes on to them, right? And, and then they do the same thing. And I think that's really important is that we, if we're some of the lucky few who are able to pursue true purpose, everybody could, but not everybody finds a path to do it. But if you do get to pursue true purpose and it's your purpose, that goes on. They see that. I mean, 
kids are sponges. They take in everything you do, everything you say, even your habits. I mean, that's one of the things I've noticed with my kids. I was saying this on the last podcast we were doing, but it's so relevant in this too. Is like, I saw this when I had my first kid and then a second one is like the way I rough housed with my first kid and all of the rough play. That's always just the thing that I've always done. I was like, you're going to be a tough, you little shit. And uh, just like right. I saw, I'm going to make sure you're tough. I'm not going to let somebody pick on you. And uh, what I realized is everything like down to really increment details. And if you ever have another child, you'll see this, but he immediately carried that over to his brother and did it to his little brother. Same things. It's like, oh, I'm going to kick you in the pants. He's like, I'm going to kick you in the pants. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the, all the little things are the same. And it's just a unique opportunity if you look at it the correct way, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. But you were talking about some of the businesses, and, and I think we have a really good picture on you and, and some of the things you've been through. And, and I guess you've got all these lessons, and now you're implementing them. You're doing these events, and, and you're trying to grow businesses. And so, I mean, what is your ideal future, and what are your, your goals and your aspirations now? You know, it's funny. Like, uh, when I went out, and you know, I, I retired from being gone from my son. I didn't, so I mean, being gone for extended amounts of time, you know, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, so I wanted to start businesses where, hey, I can be there anytime, you know, his mom was like, hey, can you watch him? Yeah. Um, so I needed to change my life and what I was doing. And I love teaching and instructing and stuff. But, you know, um, I retired from that ridiculous lifestyle of leaving my kids. So I started uh, a wine brand, and with that wine brand, it's an adventure-based wine brand. And everything that I start, whether it's a, a show or it's a wine brand or it's uh, improving my instruction I'm doing with my clients, it's got to be good. I have to feel good behind starting this brand. If I'm developing something that is just not good for society, then I don't, and it's just for money, then I would never feel good about that. Um, so, you know, the word entrepreneur, I think is bullshit nowadays. <laughs> like everybody, every hippie in Portland quits their job and calls himself an entrepreneur, right? Every girl with an OnlyFans account, every right. Twitch streamer, everybody who does Shopify so, is an entrepreneur. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be a businessman. Now is what I say now. And it's because, you know, I started one business, but it was something I already knew. It was shooting and survival and the military had taught me that. Um, but then I started a wine brand and I was like, oh, okay, I'm getting to know this. And then, you know, I always have that, uh, business mindset of trying to do more, um, learn, become better and help people out. And so when you do that, it's just, you'll naturally be successful. Um, so like the wine brands, an adventure based wine company. And so it's got things on the outside of the bottle because my, I was hitting a, uh, I was hitting a point in life where I was teaching people, but I wasn't being able to, I wasn't reaching that many people. And I was like, well, I could put little items on the outside of a wine bottle where they could learn how to use them. And it looks cool. And it's damn good wine. Um, but then I was like, oh, well, if I attach a QR code to the back of it, then now they can go and they can scan the QR code and it pre-plans 10 adventures per bottle for them. And so these adventures that I get to go and do with my kid, like, you know, for somebody that might not be able to be that savvy on planning stuff mm -hmm. or um, they need to have someone to tell them, hey, here's a here's a goal for the next year of how many, you know, what things you should do. This is essentially doing that. So it tells you a gear list. It tells you the do's and don'ts of the adventure, the good times of year to go do these adventures. And then I sell a, a picture frame and a wooden picture frame. So the goal is to, you know, you go do this adventure it's, and the links for all the gear are on there too, so you can it just makes it easy. But you go do the adventure, you buy the bottle, you scan the QR code, you go do the adventure, you celebrate that adventure with a bottle of wine, and you take a picture out there. And instead of putting it on your TikTok or your Instagram, you can do that too, but you put it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And you know, my goal was to when I first started this was to take have a a single male or female, twenty one years of age or older. Mm -hmm. They go and they do 10 adventures and they become, if they were boring to begin with, you're definitely not going to be boring after this, right? <laughs> These are 10 cool uh, adventures. And then that helps you find your, your person, hopefully mm -hmm. someone else adventures, right? Then you go, do you do those 10 adventures together with them? Then you start a family or a group and you do those with them. But like life is meant to be lived. 
It is not meant to be sit here and work in your nine to five every single day and grind in just for money and finances. It is meant to go out there and celebrate. Um, and you know, the, the, I started a wine brand that could help people do that. And I was like, I feel good about this. Um, it's not everybody's budget. It's like a 50 or $60 bottle of wine, but it's 50 to $60 wine that's in that bottle. So it's a right. mid tier one. Um, but you know, from that to, to changing my instruction on, hey, I was just teaching people uh, in large groups and nobody was really getting the things I was teaching because they're in large groups. So then mm -hmm. I simplified that. Hey, if I'm going to teach you how to go out there and kill and not be killed, like this is serious and I take that serious. And I want to give you a qualification. So I started only doing private instruction. <clears throat> and uh, I transformed that private instruction into a, now it's a two-year program for there's the adventure side where I teach you private instruction skills. And then for the serious individuals, it takes two years. There's five instructors for one client. You got to go through a psychological exam. You got to go through a physical fitness um, uh, or a physical, not a physical fitness. You got to go through a physical and psychological exam. And then we have a meeting with you. We say, hey, yeah, you're good for this. You're not good for this. Not yet. Or yes, now. And that's a two-year program on changing you physically, mentally, and spiritually to be able to uh, become a better person because some people have never been pushed right never some people have never been pushed to failure but um so these are experts in different fields that are pushing you to become if it's a guy it's pushing to become the best version of a man that you could be humble uh physically fit smart uh good communicator deals with stress well so we're not just changing people in the shooting and the survival and the sustainment aspect we're changing them all the ways and it's because i dealt with a client that he did that over the course of four courses and I saw it and I saw him change. And I was like, and his name's Brian. And I was like, light bulb. It takes two years to complete this, but I have more value uh, helping someone become what Brian became um, than I do teaching hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. So qu quality over quantity for sure. Um, but these are, we're talking about insane courses. You know, these guys, they're learning it. They start off slow, learn everything from how to navigate to how to, uh, how to shoot long range precision shooting, uh, survival sustainment. And then we, the end goal is for them to be able to, you know, go 30 miles in the mountains, self-sustaining, engaging targets, uh, with nothing but a compass, uh, a gun on their back and they're packing everything into the, into the back country. So that's something that people start off like, Hey, I'd have to lose some weight first. No, that's part of it. Uh, this guy's got to lose about 70 pounds. My next client. He's got to lose 70 pounds for it. So he has a year to lose that 70 pounds. Um, and then after that, we take, he's got a deposit of $50,000 down. Mm -hmm. So after that, if he doesn't lose that weight in a year, we take 10 grand out every month and we put it towards helping him lose weight. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, money motivates people. It does. So yeah. like, if he knows he's coming up on that year, he might want to start doing something uh, extremely fast. But, and it's not that we need to get him down to a certain weight is we need to make him capable. And then the whole thing is we decided on a weight that would be good for him to be capable to move through the mountains to do this 30 miles, because if you can do that, then you can do adventures with your kids and you can never be held back. Right. And that's what it's all about, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a businessman creating a bunch of things out there, but what I do, I've got a lot of passion for. So I think that's a lot more important probably if you really think about it. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, you're a really unique individual and uh, it's a pretty phenomenal story. And, you know, I really look forward to kind of seeing what you do and how all these things pan out for you, but I'm really grateful that you took the time to come tell your story and, and have some of these deep conversations. And uh, I can tell you ponder a lot on life. And I think that's really, that's what separates it's not a nice way to say it, but the sheep from the other people is, is the people who ponder and try to do things and change and are constantly striving to be better. That's, that's a unique thing that it seems like we don't have enough of anymore, or if we do, they're quiet about it, but I think it has to be put out there, right? I think coming on shows like this and, and the unique individuals like yourself, and there's others out there, we all know who they are, but the more vocal that we are with these types of stories and, and, and the help and trying to put the good out, I think we can drown out a lot of this hateful stuff that's going on and get rid of it i think it just it just takes more of this type of dialogue i agree so i agree man. i'm glad you came and uh your story's fantastic and 
Yeah, thank you so much. Dude, thanks for having me on. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for flying me out to Texas. I like Heck it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much time you've spent in Texas, but it's not a bad place to be. No, I don't know. I like it. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, if yeah. you'd have been here one month ago, you probably would not be saying that, but we're lucky with the weather this week for some reason. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gauge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gauge wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.